did you always feel like you had a thing for conversation? Like what made you think that that thing for you was going to be a podcast? I don't know. You just felt English English abilities yeah. and the gap in the market for it and Saudi getting bashed by media and now having yeah. the opportunity to own and tell the narrative. Oh my God, that's exactly what I was going to say you were doing. You just stole my words. I'm going to repeat them back to you once we start. <laughs> what makes you think that we didn't start? Did we start? We started. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to a very special episode of Moshe Podcast, episode 75 with Sara Thari. Sara, thank you for coming on board. It's a delight to be here, Mo. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh, and as we discussed before before filming, I did say I want, and I ask you to indulge me on a, on a little preamble because I think this is really important to say. It's such a pleasure to be here for a couple of reasons. Number one, I have been an avid follower and fan and consumer of your content for quite some time, which I think is a testament to its quality. And number two, Uh, I think you've built an incredibly sophisticated platform that, in my opinion, fills a gap in communications, in storytelling, in really proactive narrative construction in the kingdom, and through an English-speaking podcast, English-speaking platform, you've allowed us to share experiences and stories in a really accessible way with a broader international audience and with the rest of the world. And you've executed it so brilliantly. I think it's fresh, it's contemporary, it's tasteful, it's well curated. So uh, kudos and congratulations. It means the world to hear those words coming from you, Sarah. Thank you. Imagine if I wanted to be a host of a show 20 years ago, mm. how many doors I'd have to knock on, the barriers. And today it was as simple as buying the hardware you see, thinking of my content, booking a few pages for $10 a month. That's the subscription fee. The world is your market, so it's it co it costs close to nothing. And today, uh, we get a chance to show what our country is made of through people like you and the people that came before you and after you. I couldn't agree more. I think these pursuits have become heavily democratized, right? If you want to do it, you can do it. And what's nice about this is that it's grassroots, it's authentic, it's genuine, it's truthful conversation, it's heart to heart. It's not, you know, some official prepared to go on a large media platform on television with a prepared script and pre-approved talking points. I think these conversations reach people in a more impactful way, probably a lot more than we realize. Thank you again, Sada. Really, no, hats really off, good. seriously. First time I came across you, you were uh, at uh, one of the forums of, of the world, as, as you are, and you were on a table with three gentlemen I've never seen, outside of Princess Rima, I've never seen a female own the discussion where the males were looking at you. <laughs> I was one of them, by the way, through yeah. the screen. <laughs> And they were like, you are good. You oh, were talking so about funny. your field, you know, your happy yeah. place, your pharma, it was biotech. It was green hydrogen fuels. I'm going to start saying random things. I was like, who is this girl? And please tell me she's Saudi. I want to get, <laughs> I want to get, I was so impressed with your level of, uh, of how articulate you were, how knowledgeable you were, how passionate you'd speak about what you were speaking about. And, and, and I want to, I want to know is, is what you do today at the Ministry of Investment, which is where you work, is, is it something that you had your eyes set on uh, for years or is it something that just kind of happened? So first of all, that's very kind of you. Thank you for saying that. And I was the only one on that stage who had to get her, her stool chair propped up. <laughs> This is a tiny little woman amongst these men. But it was, it's, it's, a, it's a male dominated, dominated space, both the investment space and, the, and STEM in general, biotech and pharma. Uh, so it was a pleasure to, to be invited to be part of that conversation and share the kingdom's biotech story. Uh, let alone all the tech that I'm excited about that's been rapidly advancing in the field since since the pandemic struck. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. But to answer your question, um, I don't really plan ahead like that. So for me, it's uh, 
intellectual pursuits, pursuing my intellectual curiosity, casting a wide net, and really seeing what sticks, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, I went for genetics and biology because that was where I was most intellectually curious throughout my studies. But at the same time, I uh, didn't close off the door. I pursued the social sciences. I pursued some humanities. I double majored in anthropology. I collaborated with the Oxford Blavatnik School of Government and the Departments of International Relations and Political Science because I always felt like I had a number of interests uh, growing up and I wanted to find eventually a career path or a job that does that combines as many of these interests as possible because in in that way once you optimize for your interests and are able to pursue them in parallel the experience just becomes that much more meaningful what happened with the ministry of investment was just the perfect the perfect recipe or the perfect storm so it's a combination of investment and business acumen uh public policy and international relations everything that we do depends on outreach especially if you look at the foreign direct investment component. FDI is bringing in investors internationally from all over the world. And in order to do that in a compelling way, you have to tell a story. You have to reach out. You have to do what ambassadors do. And then, of course, there's the sector specificity or the sector expertise. The nice thing about the way that the ministry is set up is that we have a number of different business development verticals or sectors, right, that we focus on and we address from an investment lens or from an investment perspective. So, for example, if you look at our energy sector or tourism sector or a sports sector within the ministry, we look at it as, you know, how do we define investment opportunities? How do we add a dollar value to them? How do we go about enticing and compelling investors to, to consider them? How do we make that investment ecosystem for that sector all the more attractive? Um, so... Doing that for biotech as as the third pillar of sort of the, the three elements that the Ministry of Investment brought together for me is speaking the scientific language, right? It's going and speaking to uh, the country level associates of biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies, the global executives, the chief scientific officers, the research scientists doing R&D, speaking to them the language that I trained in, right? So it's talking to them about What's exciting in the field? What's in their R&D pipeline? Why does it make sense to bring that to the kingdom? Why does our patient population help in terms of addressing the problem they're trying to solve? So you get to speak a little bit of science, you get to engage with the business community, and you get to do a lot of uh, public policy and regulatory reform and the type of work that attracted me to government in the first place. Would you say that you have the perfect job as far as Sad is concerned? Did you land on your ideal job that for you, it's like, I can't see myself doing anything else right now? So it is a definitely a fantastic job. Uh, I, it's, it's, so, it's so hard using the perfect, the label perfect to describe anything because you sort of then inadvertently set a cap or draw a ceiling, right? Or, or you know, you, you draw some very concrete boundaries around uh, uh, attainment. And I think attainment is a lifelong pursuit. It's a fantastic job. It's an amazing platform. It's been incredibly rewarding and probably the most impactful role I've held so far. Uh, you know, but, but I think the future is full of opportunities. The future is very bright. And I'm excited to see there's so much going on in Saudi. The reason I was compelled to finish my PhD so quickly and move back to the kingdom so quickly is to have as much time as possible to explore and pursue any opportunity to create impact here. So right now, the vehicle for that for me is the Ministry of Investment. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to witness and experience whatever is next. What role would you say the ministry has in ensuring that Saudi Arabia becomes more business friendly, be it uh, via tax breaks or an environment conducive for these companies to want to come here and set up shop? So, I mean, I'll have to take a couple of steps back because uh, it's important that, I mean, audience and people watching this realize what the Ministry of Investment actually does or what it's mandated to do. So 
if we think about Vision 2030 and the primary objectives that devi- define the vision, uh, which are rooted in our transition from a resource-based economy, an oil-based economy, to a knowledge-based economy. And so, okay, then what does that mean? A knowledge-based economy is everything, right? It's it's emerging sectors, it's cutting-edge technology, it's innovation, it's end-to-end value chains, it's it's fierce competition, it's human capital and talent and, you know, uh, a, a thriving and robust uh, business ecosystem, private sector ecosystem. If you are designing, you know, something like Vision 2030 and you want to solve for economic diversification, that's the problem you're solving for. One of your answers, one of your chief answers is, the Ministry of Investment and what the Ministry of Investment does. You cannot achieve economic diversification without introducing more uh, sectors, more business, a healthy flow of capital into into the economy and into the country uh, that leads to, you know, the growth and diversification that, that we aspire to achieve. And we know that we can't do this alone, right? For not only for new emerging exciting sectors where... We still have a ways to go in terms of setting up infrastructure and ecosystem, but also for existing sectors that have operated in the kingdom for quite some time. We cannot achieve the heights and aspirations of Vision 2030 without bringing in the right and serious capital partners, institutional investors, entrepreneurs, founders, startups. We could talk to you about a lot of um, many other programs that we do in the ministry to entice these folks to come and, and see what the kingdom has to offer. And so when you get someone excited to establish an R&D facility or a prototyping facility or a laboratory or, you know, d- establish a, a, a hybrid model between a, a large industry player and one of our academic research institutions, um, really double down on segments of the value chain where historically there has been economic leakage and we haven't done a good enough job at absorbing uh, or capturing the economic value within within the country. That is what the Ministry of Investment does. But we do it end to end. So if you think about it, at the very beginning, if, if, if I'm drawing out sort of a pipeline, at the very beginning, it's outreach. So we have international offices all over the world, folks who sit there in the US, Europe, Asia, who interact with the business communities in those countries, who are there to source interesting investment opportunities, for those of us sitting in Riyadh on the ground, right? Uh, at the same time, we, as the teams on the ground, also proactively generate leads. We have a market intelligence and economic intelligence units that constantly feed the ministry with valuable data uh, that helps us generate leads in a data-driven way as well. Um, you know, the sector teams are knowledgeable about their sectors. They know what's going on. They know what exciting companies and technologies to pursue. So a huge part of it uh, uh, is outreach and engagement and bringing those opportunities in. Once you have an investor engaged or you've identified an opportunity and you have a few leads, everything from that point onwards is also uh, under the ministry's umbrella or its mandate. So we develop the right sector strategies to see where those opportunities fit within that strategy. We conduct business feasibility. I mentioned economic analysis. We uh, negotiate with companies. We provide them with incentives. Uh, We transact. We license them, right, Uh, with different flavors and and kinds of licenses. We help them set up operations. We help. We do business matchmaking. So we help them identify if they don't want to come in as pure FDI. We help them identify the right partner or the right investor. Uh, And we help them set up. And then there's aftercare, after setup. So we don't just abandon them once they've set up and invested in the kingdom. So it's a we are very much a streamlining entity. We're an overarching entity. Uh, obviously, there are, if, if you look now within the structures of various ministries, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Tourism, uh, Ministry of Sports, each of these line entities... Uh, have some sort of investment vehicle built into their to their to their ministry. We work closely with those teams, those offices, those line entities to make sure that everything that we do is a concerted effort, that it's a mutual win-win, that it's serving our mandate in terms of uh, increasing FDI by twentyfold uh, 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 by twenty thirty, uh, and helping them 
uh, fulfill their KPIs and their objectives and their mandates of sourcing the most exciting opportunities in their sectors. How long have you been in the ministry for? Almost two and a half years. In those two and a half years, what kind of changes have you seen with regards to how uh, Prospect A uh, sees our country in terms of wanting to come here and, yeah. and getting to know the culture a little bit more and eventually doing business with us? How, how have you seen that transcend? So I think there are two ways to answer that. Uh, and I'm going to go for the more sort of cr- creative and more accessible way. So there's the objective stuff. There's the numbers. You can look at all sorts of different uh, indices and metrics and World Bank reports and I don't know what reports. And and you can see how across the board, by and large, the kingdom's ranking continues to rise in business reform and ease of doing business, cost of doing business, and a number of other important criteria in the Global Innovation Index. So that's a fact, right? That, that there's this undercurrent of facts and an objective layer to this. I think the more interesting aspect is the subjective, intangible aspect, is how are people's perceptions changing uh, vis-a-vis the kingdom? You know, this used to be a very opaque market, uh, very inaccessible. Um, even even today, for established investors within the kingdom, they come to us for help, to us, I mean the Ministry of Investment, to help them navigate the market still, even if they're here on the ground, because there is something new and, ex- and exciting happening almost every day, right? So there's a new authority, there's a new entity, there's a new strategy announced, and it's important for them uh, to optimize their investment journey in the kingdom to really understand what's going on, right? So we kind of help them play catch up because we're almost a little too fast, <laughs> but uh, but which which is a good thing, right? It's a good thing because we've been so slow for such a long period of time and we can't just keep playing catch up, right? We need to catch up and then we need to compete. And we have a right to play and to compete across a number of, of competitive and exciting sectors. But to go back to your question, and I warned you that I that I uh, that I tend to go off on tangents. But to go back to your question, um, I think that if you talk to people, uh, and 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 this is something that also Princess Rima touched on in her conversation with you, forget G to G, right? If you look people to people, I think in general, um, in terms of if 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 you look at what they consume on average about the kingdom through the media. Um, I'll give you, I mean, I'll give you a concrete example. I was in Austria recently, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it was part of a program with young professional leaders and so on. There were 25 people from each, each from a different country. So 25 different countries. You had Chile, Colombia, Norway, Australia. Uh, almost everyone asked me about the line, Right. Almost everyone asked me about the line and then that led to a conversation about Neom and, and what are the objectives and what's going on and you're Saudi, you've seen it. Are they actually building? Like, is there stuff happening on the ground? And it's and it's so, it's the most rewarding thing, I'm sure you've experienced it, when you can actually give them f- these facts that they're hungry for and you can say, yes, there is work on the ground. They've started building. I've been to Neom a couple of times. I know. And so I'm communicating the reality of what's happening on the ground to these people. And they kind of look at you like, huh? Like they didn't expect that. They expected me to give them a fluffy sort of evasive answer and just say, yeah, well, you know, by 2025 or 2030. And I'm like, no, this is what's happening on the ground. They expected you to read the press release. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Which is, uh, which I don't read anyway. So (laughs) so that's not what they're getting. (laughs) But, but so, and, and it's, and and I'm using Neom as one example because it's you know it's all the rage and it's what and and the the, the announcement of the line it's strategy a good, it's a good recently. Good example. Yeah. 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 But 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 they ask about they ask about vehicles like the PIF and you know your sovereign wealth fund is making moves in Newcastle and and then of course you know another big thing that helped because I went to Austria after we beat Argentina in the World Cup so that did wonders for soft power and public influence and diplomacy for the kingdom so everyone. You know, uh, even Austrian officials that I met were like, you got, as soon as I said, where are you from, Saudi Arabia? Oh, you guys just beat Argentina. I was like, thank God that this is now what's being yeah, associated yeah, yeah, with it. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, with the line and beating, I don't think there was a better time to ever go to a No, it's like... great. It's great. I'm like, keep, keep the questions coming. Yeah. <laughs> Vision 2030. 
means so many different things to so many different people and so many different government entities and sectors by virtue of how they can contribute to the vision. When you think of Vision 2030 as a member of the Ministry of Investment, uh, what kind of relationship do you have with it and what does it mean to you? That's also a great question. And I think, you know, I wish we could ask this to almost every Saudi and, and then develop <laughs> yeah. some sort of... Yeah. Because I think you would be... You gave me an idea. <laughs> you gave me an idea. Yeah? Yeah. I think just even if you get one adjective from each person, it would just be really interesting to 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 observe what kind of palette that that creates. I uh, Vision Twenty Thirty is a north star, um, <laughs> is a blueprint, right? Uh, it's ultimately at the end of the day, it's 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 an ambition, it's a strategy, and it drives so much of of what we do because we like. We like we as human beings we like structure right we like to follow structure we like things to be neat and tidy um, although obviously if you look at the creative types who like you know ad hoc and innovation but but in in general in general I think we like to be governed by a structure that makes a lot of sense and a structure from which we can derive a deep sense of purpose and meaning because when you feel like even you as an, if you look at it as an individual. When you work towards something, you were asking me earlier, was this a job that you wanted to land? What is your five-year plan, 10-year plan, 20-year plan? We, we invest a lot in, in designing and developing those milestones in our lives because they keep us going. When you have a bad day and you think, that's okay, it's going to get me to this point in five years or point X in 10 years, all of a sudden it's worth it. What we're doing to, to, to achieve Vision 2030 objectives is so difficult. It's it's extremely difficult. It's extremely strenuous. It's intellectually challenging. It's economically challenging. Um, obviously, it has its it's 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 fun. It's rewarding, but you need to be reminded that if you persevere and you power through and you overcome the day to day, yeah, it's hard to to achieve these economic objectives. It's hard to achieve these social objectives on multiple layers. But you have a north star. You have an end goal. You have a target. I think I think it's extremely motivating and very powerful. Testament to how hard it is. Uh, it was launched with a due date in 14 years. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, 2016. Yes, correct. 14 year plan. Yeah. My God. Yeah. I mean, but you kind of you kind of need to establish a 14 year plan. Um, you know, again. I mentioned this. We, we were we were slow and almost stagnant, and we've heard this from a lot of our government uh, uh, officials who have spoken about the kingdom's transformation for a very long time in ma- many different sectors, where we were not doing ourselves a service or any justice to our not only our natural resources but our talent, uh, the kingdom's value proposition in so many different sectors that today. It's kind of our our day job as a ministry of investment to communicate to investors. When you communicate the kingdom's value proposition and you realize how Vision 2030 really uh, brought brought those value propositions to the surface, um, and I'll give you my the sector that that I handled the ministry as an example. So when we when COVID when COVID struck, okay, and we realized that our pharmaceutical industry is quite archaic in general right it's it's a it's an industry that's driven by relatively low value activity of packaging medications we have a few you know robust generics industry players saudi companies that develop you know generics medicines uh but you know we we didn't have an industry that would have prepared us for a pandemic like covid or for um any any sort of infectious disease crisis uh, or health crisis it, 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 in that sense. So for us, it was a moment where we had to confront our vulnerabilities in the sector and, uh, you know, understand how we could, you know, go back to the drawing board and develop a biotechnology ecosystem that would enable pandemic preparedness uh, that would harbor homegrown innovation, that would bring in exciting cutting-edge technology in the space, that would give Saudis access to innovative medicines 
therapeutics and diagnostics. Um, but at the very beginning of that realization process, which is sort of mid late 2020, people are scrambling trying to get you know PPE and masks and 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 make sure that people are following public health guidelines. While we were uh, back back to the drawing board, understanding how how can we begin to build a competitive medical biotechnology ecosystem? What do we have going for us? What can we double down on? And so we realized many things, uh, which is, you know, we have a very unique demographic, unique patient population. We have dig- disease registries. Uh, we have a unique genomic architecture. We have a lot of great, competitive, robust research taking place in our uh, star research institutions uh, in across the kingdom's different geographies. We need to pull a lot of that academic research out into the commercial world. We have a geostrategic location that at the time, everyone was talking about how can you broaden access to vaccines and healthcare and medical supplies. We have the largest uh, relief and humanitarian aid fund uh, and, and institution in, in the world, Markaz Malik Salman Gatha, uh, where healthcare is a key key component and pillar of, of what that um, of what that center does. And you know, from from a logistics perspective, we can we can give a lot of these different uh, disadvantaged parts of the world access to healthcare. We uh, uh, bring in and welcome uh, pilgrims and uh, for for Hajj and Umrah every year. So we do have a public health. Uh, um, we do have a responsibility when it comes to public health and ensuring that we play a role in early alarm systems, early notification, early pandemic uh, preparedness. Um, so we went back and we drew an industry and we, 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 we mapped out the value chain from innovation, research, development, manufacturing. Where can the kingdom play? Where do we have a right to compete? Where can we build arguments that are compelling to investors to come in and co-build and co-develop with us? But people were asking us to, to answer your question, why biotech? Like, why should the kingdom invest in biotech? Khalas, we're late. We uh, probably, it's going to take us like another, you know, it took countries like South Korea and Singapore who decided decades ago that they were going to be biotech clusters. Now they're competing globally. You know, how long is it going to take us? 20, 30 years? And we're probably late. So let's focus on other sectors where we have more low-hanging fruit and more of an advantage. I totally disagree with that. 100%, right? But building a case, that challenge that we heard uh, across a number of government fora and debates encouraged us to build an even stronger case for why biotech in the kingdom, right? If countries like Korea and Singapore, the examples that we use now as benchmarks for industry development, if they asked themselves when they decided to build this, why biotech? They wouldn't be doing what they're doing today. And so it's not why biotech. The right question is, where do we start? What, where's the smartest place to start? Because you bring in a few exciting opportunities, you bring a few committed, dedicated investors who demonstrate value, who demonstrate true technology transfer, building capabilities, transferring know-how. Once you're able to prove two, three, four, five success stories, it's then a domino effect. And we have a biomedical value proposition to communicate to the rest of the world, which is why we have noticed insanely increased momentum in the space over the past two years. The conversations that we have with biotech founders, life science funds, large pharmaceutical companies today is starkly and vastly different from the conversations we used to have two years ago because all of a sudden, Kingdom is a serious market and they want to do something about this sector. <laughs> دوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا اروع I asked the question because I sense that a lot has changed in 24 months for you there. Plus. Yeah. What industries do you see replacing oil and gas as a contributor to our GDP going forward? Replacing oil and gas is very strong. Is a very strong way to put it. I don't know if I will use uh replacing because at the end of the day uh you know we were built and established as an as an energy economy i think oil and gas will always be part of it but what's exciting is that 
the offshoots of the energy sector, right? Like, you know, we look at industrial biotechnology, uh, which is uh, a subsector within biotech that we call white biotech. Subsectors under biotechnology are, are, are colored. So red is medical, green is agriculture, white is industrial. The white biotech space uh, is all about sustainability, clean energy, alternative ways of doing things we've conventionally done using technology uh, that um, is either you know difficult to scale or uh, no longer conducive to the way our modern economies work. But it's things like bioplastics and biogas and biofuels and biomass and, and waste treatment to produce alternative forms of energy. So we can still lead in the renewables and alternative energy uh, uh, space because we have such deep know-how and expertise in the source sector, which is, which is energy and oil and gas. But that aside, I think there is so much to look forward to in terms of the emerging sectors where the kingdom has enormous potential. I mean, technology in general, right? If you look at digital, artificial intelligence, uh, fintech, you know, digital payments, um, and uh, everything from electric vehicles, we've seen the kingdom pursue a number of, uh, you know, bold plays in that space, uh, whether it's through Lucid or through Seed. Uh, you have things like smart autonomous logistics, uh, bringing in 3D printing technologies, robotics. I think we have a very strong digital infrastructure that then uh, you know lays out a foundation for a lot of these exciting technologies. I'm really excited about those sectors, but you know also things like um, heritage tourism, right? Tourism in general and the different offshoots of the tourism sector are exciting sectors to think about. If you look at gaming and esports, uh, the intersection of that with Web three and the metaverse. Uh, the the opportunities are endless. And the nice thing is about, obviously, you know, I would be remiss to not mention biotechnology amongst that pool of sectors that I'm excited about. Uh, I genuinely think biotech will, pl will play a very important and meaningful role in the future economy of the kingdom. Um, however, uh, I, you know, I think that the, these, are, these are all converging innovations and converging technologies uh, and will require, um, you know, a very talented, pool of people to um with high risk appetite you know you, we want founders in these spaces we want entrepreneurs in these spaces we want people who innovate and produce research and homegrown innovation in these in these sectors so it's not just about attracting fdi because of the market growth potential today but it's also making sure that we establish foundations for our youth saudi youth to innovate and play a very meaningful role in the sector and hopefully export knowledge uh, in, in these spaces. We touched on emerging sectors when we got on a call before this. Uh, is, is that what you would refer to as an emerging sector, tourism, esports, et cetera? So I would, I mean, a lot of these are established sectors, right? The, the fu fundamental, like tourism, sports, energy, these are established sectors. But there are ways in which... But tourism is kind of new. Sorry to cut you off. Tourism, yes. non-religious tourism, is, is, is kind of a new thing for us, isn't it? No, no. I mean established as in it's a globally established... Globally established. Globally established sector. We're new to the game, right? But the game has existed. Correct. There are things that are new in general, like Metaverse and yeah, Web3, yeah, yeah. where, where we're, neither, we're not late to the game, but we can, uh, if we go about these opportunities uh, uh, strategically we can make, carve out a space for ourselves. So no one's late to that game. It's a new game. Tourism is an old game. It's a new game to us. Uh, but I think, you know, we have done an incredible job. Uh, we were in an ula with, with the Catalyze program, which I know we'll touch on uh, at some point in this, in this uh, podcast. Uh, we were in an ula and we brought, you know, about 30, 25, 30 delegates with us from, from different parts of the world. And every time, this is my, I think my third time in Al-Ula, and I should go more often. Every I was time, about to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I go and uh, experience it, I'm like, I'm going to come here every month for a weekend to just meditate. <laughs> and then it just never happens. But it's, it, it, it continues to blow me away each time. It's good for the soul, Al-Ula. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's extremely, 
it's 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 very other the only other place that I've described as otherworldly in terms of the the places I've traveled around the world is Iceland because I think these places offer such a unique uh natural landscape that is uh, that completely overpowers you with such a powerful energy it feels it feels very divine and spiritual it feels like you are just by virtue of being there that you are connected with something greater than yourself truly like that's the that's the feeling that i get in certain parts of the world and ula is definitely one of them and you know so 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 that is a function of 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 geography of that place but what the royal commission has done and what all of the other entities overseeing al ula's development have done is just something truly remarkable um you know from the the infrastructure that's been developed if you look at today versus 3 4 years ago 3 4 years ago you know the first question that came up or the first you know issue the concern that came up when you said al-ula to people is infrastructure what are we going to do how are we going to get around how they've been able to develop that in 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 such a short period of time and uh uh and everything else old town new town the hotels the activities the sites the tours the tour guides are so good like it's it's even even in these uh quote unquote emerging sectors for us the way that we've been able to catch up once we put our mind to something and understand the value that it brings to us um again from a narrative perspective from a storytelling perspective from an economic perspective a social perspective tourism is one of those sectors that's so powerful because it 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 checks all of those boxes once you open up to the world you bring people in you uh you know inj- inject your economy with value at the same time you change perception it's 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 a sector worth doubling down on for sure i wonder why we were so misunderstood tourism was non existent here yeah. how are you supposed to change what the world think of you if they can't come and visit and see and experience yeah. okay us going abroad is one thing you know you can have a conversation with someone in iceland yes. and you can tell him about all about saudi arabia but how much of saudi arabia will he know unless you took him to a place like al ula unless you took him to a place like a soda it, it has to be it has to be experiential it has to be experiential because you know you, you can never you can never remove all the doubts around propaganda and bias and you're trying to influence my opinion about your country because you could go as a well-intentioned student or uh <laughs> someone who works abroad and talk about your country but it's still coming from a saudi to a non-saudi yeah. so so uh is that the, is that the, unconscious bias and i guess in some ways i mean you're you you could be expressing an authentic and genuine view of your country which is positive but the the receiving end will always um receive it with some sort of bias right because you are saudi uh and let alone then if you are a government official and, and so on and so forth but there's nothing more impactful and powerful than people coming here actually sometimes when we have casual conversations with investors we host or delegates or um Uh, or you know just talk to international people who come here and have a good time and say uh you know why do you guys think that you know people in your country or people internationally have this tainted sort of distorted view about the kingdom and what's happening on the ground and almost unequivocally the response to that is well let them come and see for themselves because there's nothing that has been able to alter their points of view in a in a really powerful way than than coming and seeing things like without having by the way they don't have to be these extravagant government hosted delegations i'll take you from the best restaurant to the best historical site to the best if they just come and experience day to day on the ground authentic day in the life of a saudi that that experience alone will be f- so different from anything they've ever read in the media it it would just blow their minds and i would go a step further and i'll say yeah. that experience would be even better than something arranged from the high up where you're going from five star to five star rub shoulders with the ge- the populace yes. get to know the people 100%. on the ground here yeah uh the word co cohe- you know when you when you mentioned how it seems like all of a sudden all these moving parts are are, are coming together and it's working we were referring about how tourism in al-ula is it just seems to work the word cohesion came to mind mm. there's a lot of cohesion in the air yes. the tour guide knows what he's doing you know the storekeeper knows what he's doing they're all contributing as if they've been doing it for 100 years yes but they've been doing it for 5 years yeah 
cohesion. Uh, so I think the glue that's bringing everyone together, you asked me what Vision 2030 means to you. I hope someone answers you with just the word glue. Because <laughs> it's, because it really, that's what it is. I think everyone knows what they're working towards. It's that simple. I mean, if you think of it, even you, you we were talking earlier and you mentioned prior to, to pursuing this as a full-time passion that you were in the corporate world. Even in the corporate world, when they teach you management 101, right, leadership 101, you have to corral everyone around uh, a unified vision and a unified strategy. And if it's an effective one, and if it's done properly, it'll motivate everyone for a reasonable a reasonable period of time, right? Obviously, you need different layers of motivation and incentives, and but but I think that's what's bringing really everyone together. Uh, and what's even more exciting is that you know maybe 2016, 2017, early days, it was a lot of um, strategy on paper. It was a lot of behind the scenes. Let's cook this up in the kitchen. Let's experiment with it in the lab. But right now, today, execution. it's ex- it's execution yeah. mode. So it gives people so much energy to see, you know, the 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 ground have, you know, no resorts in al Uda, And then all of a sudden you have these amazing experiences like Banyan Tree and Habitats and these hotels where, you know, you you you've seen them being developed. You've seen these develops happen from scratch uh, and you feel like you're part of the movement and part of the execution and part of the change. And I think that's where a lot of the cohesion comes from. Um, you might have kind of answered this question in, in, in the last segment, but uh, let me ask it anyway. What would you say we have learned, A, as a country or, or you as a, a member of the Ministry of Investment, uh, from the pandemic in terms of policies, platforms that we use now, and just the industry as a whole, what were the biggest learnings from the pandemic? So I think I answered some of those pieces already, so I'm not going to uh, go. I mean, we talked about platforms like mRNA. We talked about uh, securing s- supplies. We talked about confronting the gaps that we had in the ecosystem. So why couldn't we be more prepared um, from, a, from a biotech and pharmaceutical perspective? Why couldn't we participate or why didn't we participate in global clinical trials where many uh, cohorts from many different countries were recruited for COVID therapies, for monoclonal antibodies, for vaccines? Um, none of those trials from the companies that led the uh, development and, uh, um, and production of COVID vaccines or treatments conducted sort of any meaningful developmental activity in the kingdom, right? Which is which is a big missed opportunity. So for example, that led us to go back and say, how do we optimize our clinical trials landscape to make it more attractive to investors? And then really double down on the policies and the regulatory reform, of course, in conjunction with, again, the leading and line entities in those spaces. In this case, the Saudi Food and Drug Authority and the, and the, and the healthcare ecosystem and our healthcare apparatus. We ultimately will always continue to play a supplementary and supportive role uh, when you compare us with the line entities leading these sectors. But we, tr- we we try our best to add as much value as we can and bring in an investment perspective. So in this piece of clinical trials, you know, this is the economic value we're missing out on. This is how much investment we can attract through clinical trials. This is how many jobs clinical trials have created historically in competitive economies and, and build and build an objective investment driven case for that segment of of the value chain. So that's what we try to do. So clinical trials is one example, but also manufacturing, right? We couldn't produce a single vaccine in the kingdom throughout COVID. Um, our our vaccine production capabilities are limited to um, again, you know, very downstream, uh, uh, packaging of syringes and so on, not to get too technical. But if you look at the um, strategies and the initiatives two years ago versus today that are in place to deeply and heavily incentivize localization of products strategic for national health security, like vaccines, there is so much going on behind the scenes to ensure that we are never in that position again, where we are only you know, performing 
that very final segment of of the chain and missing out on all the rest of the immense value, not just from an economic growth and diversification perspective and creating high tech jobs and bringing in talent. That's great. But in, in some of these cases in this sector, this is like a national health security agenda, right? And so we're doubling down on ensuring that uh, we are prepared and capable and have all of the necessary building blocks uh, uh, if if something like this com- comes around again. Yeah, I was going to ask you, God forbid, uh, how how well would we handle one to come our way of the magnitude of COVID? Um, and, and everything in me tells me that, yeah, you know, we... We took our punches uh, and we dealt with it, I think, better than the majority of countries did, uh, just by virtue of, of of what I've seen and what I've read and what I've heard. Um, how, how much well-prepared would we be? You touched on us being a lot less dependent on importing is what I think I've, yes. I've, I've garnered. Would we be better off in facing the next one? So... I, I want to I want to. So that's a resounding yes on my part, because I think we have all of the right building blocks in place. What I do want to distinguish is that our healthcare system in terms of services, public health authority, uh, containing the pandemic, tracking and tracing technology, diagnostics that we have been able to do incredibly well. Um, the Ministry of Health at the helm of those efforts Uh, with Wiqaya and the Saudi Food and Drug Authority and all of the relevant entities, I think, have led us through the pandemic in a way that if you look at um, where the kingdom has ranked in terms of dealing with COVID, I think in, 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 in a couple of important and impactful indices, we ranked like two, second place, third place. So it's quite, quite high. So that, uh, our, our response mechanisms, I think, were fantastic. And, you know, obviously our healthcare apparatus is always looking to improve. The piece that I was focusing on in terms of where we need uh, serious development and transfer of technology and know-how and investment attraction is in the space of uh, drug development, right? Therapeutics, vaccines, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the, anti- uh, the, 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 the therapies that uh, came out for COVID are monoclonal antibodies. These are complex like protein-based technologies that require very specific facilities uh, with very specific certifications and a very highly qualified pool of technical talent. And it also requires, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, research and development and and clinical validation. And these are complex processes, right? That we now realize, uh, A, we need to incentivize. So we've We're designing incentive packages to to entice companies to transfer the, that technology and know-how. And B, we need because, uh, you know, when, when and if the next pandemic hits, we uh, can be to a certain degree uh, self-sufficient, right, for a reasonable period of time. What about AI? Some people say that, uh, you know, computers are going to take over the world in 10 years, someone uh says not in our lifetime some people say never um uh, as far as ai is concerned i should dial in elon musk <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see what he has to say about it um can you uh perhaps share like a, a um like a story or, or or some something whereby you guys used artificial intelligence in in your capacity so uh I, I I wish I wish our work required uh, using artificial intelligence algorithms to, but I, I so in gov in in my go- role in government we don't use artificial intelligence directly but it's obviously a platform technology that we're very interested in in terms of attracting leading investors and companies in in this space. So if you look at artificial intelligence software and hardware companies, uh, these are around the world, right? These are projected to grow from i think it's something like 3 trillion us dollars to 90 trillion us dollars in enterprise value by 2030 so this is an insane level of growth and at the same time again if you look at it as a platform technology the cost of training uh is is in, in artificial intelligence is decreasing at a rapid pace 
the performance of artificial intelligence tools is increasing at a rapid pace. And what it does is it just collapses timelines for you, right? So it speeds up processes that would otherwise take a long amount of time to, you know, validate or to conduct the research. And and it also reduces cost. Um, so I talked a lot about the value chain of, of the, the sector. If you look at how artificial intelligence is applied across the value chain, right? So in the early stages of basic science and research and innovation, uh, DeepMind, which is a Google or an Alphabet uh, uh, um, subsidiary, uh, owns a platform called AlphaFold. AlphaFold is uh, an artificial intelligence platform uh, driven by deep learning technology that predicts the way amino acids fold into 3D protein. That's really important. Why? Because uh, your DNA is ultimately, if we go back to uh, to biology in high school, your DNA is ultimately translated into RNA that then is translated into protein. Uh, if if that protein is somehow dysfunctional or is, doesn't fold properly or is missing something, then it, then it usually leads to disease. So understanding protein biology and how proteins fold is really uh, uh, crucial. The existing technologies, crystallography, magnetic resonance, some techniques that, that scientists have used to determine the way that, pro, that, that amino acids fold into proteins are um, A, uh, like difficult, laborious, not, not scalable. Um, and, and if they were scalable, we would have, we would have discovered a lot, th- the way a lot more proteins fold than we currently do. AlphaFold predicts these for you based on the data that already exists, right, through deep learning technologies, uh, and has done so to a reasonably accurate uh, degree that has impressed, you know, the 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 field the field at large, and is a and is a reliable tool in that space. If you look at drug discovery, you usually have to undertake, you know, a rigorous number of preclinical experiments, and you work with cells in a lab, and you validate, and you have all these experiments and assays that take a really long time. The experiments, you know, for for a standard or average PhD student doing research in biology, it could take anywhere from three, four to six, seven years just to get your exper- oh. your experiments done, right? Your experiments done and and have enough results to put together a thesis that you can then defend, a PhD thesis. AI in drug discovery is hugely emerging um, and using, you know, in silico computational tools what that's doing is relying on machine learning to identify drug targets, which was what you would do, spend years trying to do and validate in a lab. Based on all of the existing literature, there's so much literature out there in terms of protein-protein interactions, metabolic pathways, you know, the, 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 the scientific knowledge that exists can then be sifted through and utilized to, in a really intelligent and smart way, identify targets that then you can quickly design therapies to, to address. So you're already you've already taken out two segments or addressed two segments of the value chain. You go to manufacturing, right, and production, and things like you know uh, uh, robotics and autonomous logistics, and you know even in the lab we have these robots that now do the the pipetting, so taking liquid from one vial to another for you. These are all driven by a lot of these algorithms. Uh, and so on and so forth. Up until I mentioned autonomous logistics, up until like distribution, distribution uh, uh, technologies and, and packaging, and so on. So that is, I, I I use these specific examples along the value chain just to, to demonstrate to you how immensely valuable this artificial intelligence as a platform technology can be for one sector, uh, uh, let alone you know what it can do for so many other sectors. It's it's some just ultra complicated, super robust information. But but yeah, uh, just just to hear you say that it uh, it's going to go from three billion to ninety in eight in eight years. Trillion. Tr- trillion. Trillion U.S. dollars. Yeah. From three to ninety. Yes. In eight years is uh, is this telling. This is b- based on based on a reliable number of uh, predictions. Mm-hmm. Yes, an enterprise value market cap, uh, the AI industry is just going to skyrocket because we've barely scratched the surface. We're still, I mean, uh, you know, um, 
AI purists will tell you that none of the data is reliable yet, right? So because because we're barely scratching the surface or it needs many more years of validation and verification until we can rely on it, you know, accurately. Right now, I think the most immediate accessible applications are like generative AI, right? So I'm sure you've seen these apps where you can upload 20 of your your own images and then it produces these AI generated versions of them. Uh, or or the the uh, increasingly over the past two weeks or so, uh, all of tech Twitter have been talking about GPT-3, which is the the language processing tool, AI driven language processing tool, which does everything from copywriting to translation to uh, composing poetry. Wow. Right. And we always talk about how AI displaces and you just give it a prompt of text, right? Or you give it keywords and it'll produce human like text for you. Um, so and I wish that was the case when I was a college student because you give it a prompt <laughs> and it writes your paper and <laughs> and you're all set. But say. but but I think but I think that, you know, the debate uh, in, in the early days of 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 this emerging technology was that it's going to to replace knowledge workers or it's going to replace these algorithms Robotics are going to replace manual labor um, and displace jobs in that way. But you're talking about algorithms that can now produce creative stuff, art, that in some and in, in, in many instances, at least a lot of the generative AI I've seen circulating on social media is quite impressive. Uh, so that's going to get better. And so what does that mean for artists in terms of competition? Right. It's it produces creative language. Also, poetry. Right. If if you're feeding an algorithm uh, data from basically all the greatest poetry that's ever existed in the universe as text, it's going to be good at doing po- or, or producing poetry. Oh, yeah. So what does that mean for the humanities and for the arts and for literature? It's going to be really exciting to witness over time. Totally. I'm excited about this question because I know it excites you. Um, Catalyze Saudi platform, which is yeah. under the ministry. Super interesting. I, I, you know, I'm just going to ask you to walk me through it without asking any further questions. Sure. So Catalyze Saudi, you're right. I'm very excited about this question because I'm very proud of this program. Um, and it was sort of a, a, a small grassroots idea that we had that turned into something far more impactful than we would have uh, anticipated or imagined. And it's an engagement platform if I'm going to be very brief, which I'm not very often, <laughs> but it's an engagement platform that brings together um, institutional investors, family offices, entrepreneurs, founders, thought leaders under a particular theme uh, with their counterparts in the kingdom. The objective of this engagement platform is to build high-touch, highly curated connections and networks between these groups and showcase what the kingdom has to offer for these groups in terms of co-investment opportunities, exciting technology, uh, again, exposing them to development on the ground in the kingdom. We talked about seeing what's happening in the line on the ground. We talked about the impressive development in Ula. One of the main objectives of this program is to bring people who are interested in engaging with their counterparts in the kingdom to see these developments for themselves. Because these developments, at the end of the day, present promising investment opportunities for for these groups. So that's what it is ultimately. And what we do is there are different iterations of the program. The first iteration we launched in the inaugural one, we launched in March on the sidelines of the F1 in Jeddah. And the theme for that first iteration was disruptive technology. So we wanted to keep it broad because we wanted to invite folks from the venture capital space, from the private equity space, uh, both in California, from China, from different parts of the world, um, people who are innovating in exciting areas of technology, founders, entrepreneurs to uh, the kingdom. We also invited the mayor of Miami. He, The way that he has, as, as part of this first iteration of Catalyze, because of the way Miami has transformed over the past couple of years into this tech magnet, into a, into a VC and entrepreneur magnet. We wanted to learn from him firsthand how we could replicate the Miami experience. And by the way, Miami has done this at its peak during COVID. 
um, you know, if you you'll find so many articles online about this mass exodus from New York and Silicon Valley into Miami. Uh, if you talk to, you know, if you look at the real estate market in Miami and who's occupying buildings and apartments now, it's all the entrepreneurs, the investors, the young tech scene. Really, uh, this is pre- post COVID, huh? It, it's it it started before COVID, but it escalated during COVID. I think had a lot to do with the way Florida handled COVID overall. Mm-hmm. For a lot of these young people who wanted to continue to go out and work and and have you know dynamic and engaging lives, but I think that uh, you know this started with uh, th- the mayor's vested interest in blockchain and the cryptocurrency space that attracted a very um, you know uh, competitive pool of talent that then served as a magnet for the rest of the disruptive technology landscape and it's quite remarkable i mean if if you know i i frequent miami i frequent the us and so i've i've followed those stories and i've witnessed the change that has that has occurred in miami and so that was one of the reasons for example we hosted uh uh the mayor of miami as part of this disruptive tech delegation under the umbrella of catalyze saudi and what we do in these in these programs is that it's it's part entertainment and culture Right. So we so at the time there was the F1 in Jeddah. So we hosted them in, in the F1. They, they saw the race. Uh, we took them to private uh, dinners uh, in, in Jeddah for people who, you know, graciously hosted our delegates. We, uh, you know, expo- they, they had free time to go and explore cafes, restaurants, uh, you know, go out on the streets. So it's 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 an authentic uh, engagement with the city that they that we host them in. Um uh, with with you know a program and an itinerary, but also embedded within that program and itinerary are a series of roundtables and panels. Because the idea is this is this is an exchange of uh, uh, of thought of discourse. We want Saudi counterparts to talk to them about what's happening here and what's what excites them about the kingdom, what excites them about the space. In that case, it was disruptive technology, and we want our local audience to hear from our delegates or our guests, uh, what they're excited about and what they're bullish on Mm -hmm. uh, and where they are willing to co-invest and inject capital. And those conversations, both in the first iteration of Catalyze and the second one, which we recently hosted in Al-Ula, have been incredibly productive and conducive to building a lot of relationships. The second iteration that we did in Al-Ula, because... Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago coincided with the World Cup taking place in Doha. And I think it was between right before the semifinals or between the semis and the finals. Um, I know we saw the uh, the England-France game in al So if that, if that was a semifinal, that was then a that's semi. when it was. That yet. was a semi, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we took them to al They had a, uh, um, a program an immersive program where they had they took the you know the cult the cultural the cultural tours the heritage sites we took them to nice places to eat they they interacted again authentically with the landscape with the place uh did they love it they were blown away they were blown away one of the one of our guests was so the theme as i was saying because we did it on the sidelines of the world cup was the future of entertainment hospitality and sports and so we brought a really great pool and by the way catalyze the size of uh, uh, the catalyzed groups that we host are usually between 20 and 30 people, 25, 30 people. So it it's it's highly curated. And we make sure that we bring profiles that, uh, you know, we, we understand why they'd be interested in the kingdom, why their counterparts in the kingdom would be interested in them. Uh, um, and so, you know, it makes for just a, 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 a much more um, high signal to noise experience. And I think that you know, for, for Al-Ula as a landscape, you know, we had uh, uh, a famous uh, movie producer, uh, director who was part of the Catalyze delegation, who probably, you know, produced all of the movies that you think are <laughs> are legendary in Hollywood. Just, you know, someone who just comes with incredible breadth and experience and just an eye for scenery and 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 hearing what he had to say about the potential for a thriving and robust film investment landscape and film industry in in Saudi, uh, just based on what he saw in Al-Ula, uh, was, you know, incredibly refreshing to hear. Were you always studious? Were you always serious about what you do, even from your schooling days? Uh, 
Yeah. So I mean, this is my segue. I, I, to I wanna, Oxford. I want, I want to be cool and say no, but I can't because everyone watching this, my family, <laughs> friends included, are like, you've always been such a dork. So I can't avoid answering this question with anything other than a yes. So I mean, yes, I was always that person that you know s- studied really hard and top of my class, all those things. But uh, you know, increasingly. I I and I've and I've worked a lot on this and and you want to transition to Oxford Oxford the time that I spent in Oxford was integral to this is I worked worked hard on not taking that side of my life or that part of me as seriously as I used to growing up you know as an ambitious hard working studious kid how do you reflect on your time spent in yeah. Oxford now we're starting to get to know side of the person So Oxford, I can describe as probably the single most transformative experience in my life, not because of the just the academic and intellectual side of it. Oxford was unique in many respects. I mean, the university setup in and of itself is unique. The collegiate system where you have the different colleges uh, uh, that are essentially, you know, your social life your uh, space to network with other students, pursuing other programs, uh, that that set that university experience apart from doing graduate school in a very technical field in any other part of the world. Because then you're stuck with your program, you're stuck with the people you do the, the research with in your lab, for example, and you would have to actively curate what you do outside of, outside of your PhD. Oxford curated an end-to-end experience for, for me that exposed me to people studying and doing research and innovating in so many different fields. I was just constantly surrounded by uh, intellectual input, intellectual conversations, debates about outside of, outside of the lab, right? So the PhD experience aside, the social life of, of living in Oxford town, being part of the college I was affiliated with, you know, having dinners and, 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 you know, very ceremonial Harry Potter like dinners, but dinners nonetheless, and, and, and coffee and catching up, uh, uh, in the graduate common rooms with people doing everything from PhDs in, in Latin and Greek and history, masters in public policy, uh, the undergraduates doing, uh, 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 philosophy, political science and economy, the Oxford Union, the world's oldest debating society, which I immerse myself also in completely. So, um, you know, let alone all of the traditions that that the university holds very near and dear, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, punting and the rowing competitions. And there was just so much to explore. And prior to that, I was in Boston. In Boston, uh, it, it just so happened that my siblings and I, we, we all sort of overlapped be it two, three years apart from each other. So my older brother was there. I overlapped with him. He left. My sister came. So we were always living with family. And as you know, uh, a lot of Saudis ended up studying or st- study in Boston. So I had friends from school. I had, you know, uh, uh, friends of friends. It was like a microcosm of Saudi outside of, <laughs> of Riyadh. So uh, in terms of... Uh, the the social and cultural awakening that I think informed a lot of who I am today, that came from Oxford because I was living alone, um, very few Saudis, and you had to immerse yourself completely. So in that way, it was it was very transformative. Let alone the fact that you know I worked, I did my PhD with really pioneers uh, in in my field some of the most highly cited uh, research scientists in the space of diabetes genomics, which is what I did my PhD in, t- two incredibly intimidating PIs and supervisors, and I'm going to shout them out, Mark McCarthy and Anna Gloin, who just shaped me and molded me into the intellectual character that I am today in terms of how well I write, how well I present science, how accessible it is, how rigorous I am in my intellectual pursuits. Um you know, they've pushed me so far outside of my comfort zone with my PhD. And I will forever be thankful to them for that because had they not pushed me so far out and really, you know, it's like whenever I feel like I got to the edge and that's as much as I can give, they identified more potential. 
here's here's what else you can do. Here's so I went in, for example, to the PhD program, uh, not knowing a single word of code. And one of my supervisors, Mar- Mark McCarthy, I mean, is supervises teams who do statistical genetics and sequencing analysis, and it's all people writing Python and R and and all these coding languages and scripts, and and it was an integral part of the science. So they encouraged me to 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 learn coding from scratch. He uh, he allowed me to sort of uh, basically uh, spend time with all of his postdocs and research students who were fluent coders. Sit with them for a few months, put pause on everything else, and learn how to code. Uh, and I pi- and I picked it up organically without taking courses or classes or um, because they gave me they encouraged me they gave me the capacity they realized the potential that that could have on my research on on me on my career on my skill set and they and they gave me the opportunity and time and resources to pick to pick up that skill which is an incredibly difficult skill i mean it's a statistical programming language but that's what they that's what they did that's why not only oxford but them as phd supervisors for me at that time that sort of combination again it was like the perfect storm of being in the right place at the right time working with the right people uh, so so transformative is the word I would use to describe Oxford. Are you the same Sada today without Oxford in your life? No way. No way. Oxford, I mean, not only, not only, again, from a social perspective, from an intellectual perspective, was it very enriching. Uh, it opened up my eyes to the world in ways that I thought were not possible. So because... The research uh, is so strenuous. It was it was such a it was such a difficult task. Probably the most difficult task I will ever do in my life is is the PhD that I did for a number of reasons, right? And I won't. But it was it was the most difficult thing in the world. And I remember when I used to uh, call home and speak to my mom and complain about how, you know, I'm I don't feel as smart as I used to be, and I don't feel like I'm you know the most exceptional person here, and this is really hard, and you know this my my experiment failed or whatever. Complain to her about anything. She always obviously you know encouraged me and motivated me, and um, and she used to say to me, this is like when a Navy SEAL undergoes their training. Their training is meant to be the hardest thing they encounter so that anything they encounter in the field pales in comparison, right? Or at least is manageable. They know how to navigate it. So she told me, by the time you finish, you're going to thank me for saying this to you because you will realize that everything else that life hits you with, this experience at Oxford will feel like Navy SEAL training. And so far, that has proven true. I, I, I And I don't think I will encounter anything on a collective level that will be as difficult as that experience, psychologically, emotionally, intellectually, mentally. And so in that sense, there's no way I would have been the same person with the same emotional, mental resilience, with the same intellectual capacity, with the same ability to tap into different reserves in my brain and, and identify patterns and, and make links and, 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 and you know be as critical and analytical as I am. I think a lot of that you know, Boston and my time at Wellesley, which was liberal arts school outside of Boston, that was transformative in its own way because I was exposed to things like anthropology and theater and and took courses in history and in art and art history. Oxford was a Oxford was like a psychological game. <laughs> Oxford was like a real psychological game. At the same time, in order for you to to endure an experience like that, you have to center and align yourself somehow because otherwise then it gets too much so I was very athletic during my time there I did a lot of strength training I lifted weights uh, I did pull-ups and push-ups and 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 you know released a lot of the tension from the intellectual pursuit in a phys- in a really healthy physical way so I was probably at the healthiest I was from a physical perspective mentally I have had to do a lot of soul searching and alignment and sort of break everything down into first principles and build convictions back up again to be able to give me that that um, resilience and the tenacity to continue to believe and to keep going and to make sure that as I evolve, because I was evolving very rapidly over the course of those four years, 
just by virtue of how old I was at the time and by virtue of the intensity of the experiences I was undergoing. So, so I made sure that I constantly um, sort of re-evaluated who I am to myself uh, uh, and, and continue to have sort of a, a grasp of, of my, my identity, deconstruct it, reconstruct it to fit with the way I was evolving with, you know, evolving intellectually, evolving emotionally, evolving, just growing up as a person. So all of, it just so happens that all of these things happening in parallel led to a really profound experience. And because on top of all of that, I was living alone for the first time, meaning without any family members, no parent, no sibling, no uh, friends of friends or uh, from, from Saudi or, or friends of my sister or friends of my brother. It was just uh, me, myself and I. Uh, when I come back, you know, after I socialize with people, I come back to my apartment and it's me with myself, with my thoughts, trying to recenter, realign, build resilience, build tenacity, build conviction uh, for something that I was enduring at the time that was so difficult. And, and I think that's why it was exceptionally profound. It sounds exceptionally profound. <laughs> uh, I mean, Navy SEAL comparison, I think, was... I was so immersed into that story. It's, ma it's, ma it's, it's, a, it's maybe a little hyperbolic, but it, it, is, it is true. It, was, it makes it sense. It was so rigorous. It yeah. makes sense. You hear about Navy SEALs being the, the, the toughest MFs in the world, uh, and, and, and the idea of the training is that in battle, you won't have to face what you face in training. And, right. I, and a similarity with Oxford like really hit home with me that uh, what you're doing today will never be as difficult as, and that's the Oxford program. We're prepping you to be bulletproof and battle-striped for the world. A hundred percent. Wow. Um, I have this theory that, first of all, I should be calling you doctor, right? No, you shouldn't. Not at all. <laughs> If you're not going to go to the top 100 universities in the world, I think universities today are a way to make money. Mm. I saw a stat as to how long it takes to make a bachelor's degree profitable, and it was about 18, 18 years to make it profitable. Okay, it's it, there was a there was a weird um, there was an ironic thing whereby you need money to go to school. Uh, and then you go to school to get a job, and then you get a job to pay back the to loan that you did for school. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which was actually quite hilarious. Um, what I've been seeing in the corporate world is mm. that you have these fresh grads come out, and they've done 23 years, 24 years maybe of schooling, and when they hit the floor, they don't have a clue. Yeah. Now a year of work experience or two years of work experience I think can do more than what the last seven or eight years did for you between college and, and, and high school. Mm. Um, you are just more into the flow of things. You know yourself. You know your deliverables. Mm. And at least I've seen it in myself that work experience gave me so much more than I need to contribute to society or a company or a corporation yeah. than how long 24, 23 years of schooling took me. It's almost like what I'm trying to get at is that I, I just think that it it, it, it it prolongs a little bit. It's a bit too stretched. Yeah. If you're going to a, if you're not going to one of the top 100 universities in the world, if you are, then amazing. That's going to mold you for like what you're going to face in life. Do you do you share where I stand on like the debate between uh, work experience versus do we all have to do 23 years of schooling even if you are of average intelligence? Yeah. Well, I mean, the question of intelligence and IQ this is like, you know, endless debates. But I, but and by the way, you won't hear the same account from everyone who has gone to Oxford. That was just my experience. Right. Some people could just tell you, you know, yeah, I did research. It was tough. I defended my thesis, I graduated and I left. And it, it, it's it's a very, I think it varies vastly from person to person depending on what intentions you go in when you start an experience like that. I wanted it to transform me. So I immersed myself in it completely. Um, and 
and I and I'm and I'm not sure that you know everyone has the same experience. You know, does does a good school, top twenty, top fifty, top hundred, prepare you in a way that is um, more useful to the job market or to the world? Maybe in certain practical skill sets, um, you know, uh, coding, statistics, uh, maybe writing. You know, other again, other other skill sets that would be useful if you go into the job market knowing how to write, uh, you know, a, a, a foolproof email that is professional and brief and no gr- grammar or spelling errors, that's that's a good thing. You know, if you're going to do financial modeling and you know the basics of modeling and statistics, that's also a good thing. So from a practical from a practical perspective, I think an education is useful. Do you necessarily need, you know, that, that type of setup to learn those skills? Increasingly, the, the answer is no, right? Because you can learn them from a lecture on YouTube or you can access them anywhere. It just depends on how disciplined you are. But I think what's 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 interesting is that the abundance of content and information online uh, is sort of correlated now with this inability, people's inability to focus and to sit through, I mean, long form content like this and we talked about other other podcasts that go three four hours long there is a market for that right there is an yeah. appetite and an interest for that but i think in general people have and myself included have shorter attention spans so i feel like in in that context if i'm not forced to sit in a classroom and pay attention and feel like you know i left my family i'm all the way in boston let me, I, I need to make this experience worth it. I need to sit in this lecture hall and listen to that professor and focus, pay attention so I can make, so I can get good grades, make sure I get a good degree. And then, so, you know, there's multiple layers of motivation for someone like me who hates structure and is very unstructured and undisciplined. And so that would help someone like me. I would never be able to sit through an hour YouTube lecture teaching me, you know, the basics of of Java or Python, right? I just, I would rather sit and have a chat with someone who knows how to do it, learn it from them firsthand, go take a t- coffee break, hang out, come back. It's it's sort of, so it depends on your attitude and temperament and disposition when it comes to picking things up from pools of information and knowledge. And this is, like I said, all become democratized. So you can, uh, I guess, replace um, a level of a formal education through this abundance of information that exists online and pick up really meaningful skills too. Um, are we ready to just abandon that system entirely? I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I, and I'm sure that there are extensive intellectual debates in the education space about this. Um, but I, 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 I don't know if we're ready to... Compl- because it's not about... It's, it's not... And you hear this about, uh, you know, parents who have young kids and debate homeschooling versus mm. school right it's 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 in many ways that that that's a that's a debate that mirrors what we're talking about because the argument that parents usually make for real school it well i shouldn't say real school but s- s- like traditional school is that kids get to interact with other kids and they develop personalities and and emotional intelligence and all of these things that they wouldn't necessarily develop or pick up um in the living room with a tutor and their parents or just their parents and their siblings. Uh, and that's what, that's what Oxford was for me. It wasn't just the material, the research that I was doing. It was all of those other experiential uh, moments that, that contributed so much to my experience. The dinners, the social interactions, the conversations, the going, the after hours, listening to debates at the Oxford Union, the doing this, doing that. Those are the experiences that really matter. Um, so those, I think, are not replaceable yet and uh, hold a lot of intangible value that manifests in different ways in terms of the return on that, the investment you make in immersing yourself in those experiences. I was just thinking for a second, what a privilege and an opportunity and an opportunity cost for those who would not leverage on who you have around you in a school like Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or MIT, Mm. the outside of the classroom opportunities uh, in who you are within arm's reach of networking with, who you can get to know. And it's funny because you keep going back to that point, but it's a big one. That's what it was, yeah. Yeah. But but, but there's a lot of people who go in, again, it's about your disposition and how intentional you are about the experience. A lot of people go in 
and they're just like, you know, this is school. It's the same way a lot of people approach a job, right? This is a job. I'm going to clock in. I'm going to do the bare minimum and what's what's expected of me, what I'm being paid to do. And then I'm going to clock out and disconnect from that and call it a night. That's something that I never did, could never do. Um, it's robotic. Yeah, but 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 that but sometimes uh, that you know it does it for people. Some people are okay with that, and they're fine doing that, and they're fine doing that for the rest of their lives. Some people approach their educational experience in that way: of I'm going to go in, I'm going to do these classes, I'm going to write these papers, put in the bare minimum, not do the readings. I used to do my college readings not because I was you know a dork and wanted to participate in class and in the seminars and and. I I wanted to read those readings like genuinely like not skipping paragraphs not skipping pages because I was never exposed to that kind of literature like I was just when I was reading political theory and anthropology and uh, you know Shakespeare and I mean we we weren't teaching Shakespeare at least in 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 the the programs that existed in the Riyadh that I grew up in right so a lot of this a lot of these disciplines and a lot of these schools of thought and 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 writings and um I was just not exposed to. So it was out of a place of genuine intellectual curiosity. And if you don't go in with the intention of of developing yourself somehow in that way, um it's like it's like you know writing or public speaking or some of these some of these skills. Like I I I always grew up loving to read and and so I think that's my my writing skills originated from my love of reading and picking up subtleties and nuances of different ways authors structure sentences and so on. But I was also always fascinated with articul- like people who are articulate to me. There's something about being articulate that from a very young age struck me as like such a fascinating skill. And I would watch talk shows endlessly before, you know, you know, really good podcasts were 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 available and popular. And, you know, we have all these famous podcasters that, you know, we discussed earlier a few episodes that 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 we uh, enjoyed before that i would watch talk so talk shows i would watch bits of lectures of people who i thought were uh masters in conversation or in in public speaking because i was so fascinated like how could someone formulate a sentence like that on the spot right to me it was just i'm fascinated with language putting words together in writing putting words together in speech and then doing it under pressure and on the spot is like a completely different ball game so there was just a natural inclination and, and drive and curiosity for me to understand how people have that skill set and how can I develop it in turn. That's something very intentional. I wanted to be that person also going into college as like, you know, a young person who studied well, worked hard, got good grades, top of, top of my class. I always wanted to be that person who could sit and and just pull from my mind, you know, various reference points of, you know, Uh, different schools of thought, different philosophers, different economists, and be able, sometimes you sit with intellectuals and they're able to cite like, you know, this piece from from this author or or this theory from this from this intellectual or this scholar. And to me, that was, I felt like that was a really valuable and use, useful thing to also develop. And it comes from being well-rounded. It comes from reading a lot outside of your discipline. It comes from also reading intentionally and picking up information that's interesting. So, I mean, I could describe to you so many different ways that my experiences towards learning and picking up skills have been intentional. And that's why uh, I think some of them stuck or that's why some of them I've been able to ultimately realize because of that intention, the intentionality in that pursuit. If you approach it nine to five, uh, bachelor's degree, master's, because when I come back, I'll be more qualified and 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 not for you have to treat it as an end in and of itself and not a means to an end i think that's a better way to put it than than everything i just yeah. described is that if you treat the experience as a means to an end you've diluted almost all of its value if you treat it as an end in and of itself then and that's and people always ask me by the way you have a phd in genetics what are you doing in in misc or in, or in misa or in government or you know why aren't you doing genomics research in a laboratory and and doing what it makes sense for people to think you should do with a PhD in genetics, right? And that's so interesting to me because it's like th- there is a lack of understanding there that that PhD in that discipline at that time 
was an end in and of itself. Like I told my uh, interview panel at Oxford, which is a very controversial thing to say going into a university, that I didn't want to, they asked me about what I would do if I got into the PhD program, which they were evaluating, evaluating me for. What would I do with my PhD after? Usually the answer is, you know, I'll go apply for a postdoc here and do this and do that. And maybe, you know, assistant professor, adjunct professor, build your way up, develop a lab. That's the traditional academic career path. Um, they're investing in you as a young scientist. Typically, that's where they would like you to go as a university, right? And for me, I just said, no, I have no intentions on in staying in academia at all. I mean, I was going into the program four years younger than coming out of it and knowing then that it was an end in and of itself because I was fascinated with the genetics because I thought it was cool because I thought there's probably no other subject that is equally challenging and intellectually rewarding to me at the same time than this. So this is what I'm going to do. But it's not necessarily something that I'm going to be interested in. Well, I'm, I will always be interested in it, but it's not something that I want to dedicate the rest of my career to, right? And I think that if you can tie this back into your original question of really any modern economy today is based on skill sets and based on you being able to tap into them when you need to for the job you need to, whether that's building your own company or working for another company or working for government, this traditional, archaic, conventional way of looking at a CV and picking up a discipline and pigeon pigeonholing you into a category, I think this is an obsolete way of evaluating people coming into the job market. And that's what we need to be careful about. And that's what we need to revise, I think, a few steps before we begin to uh, critique the legitimacy now or the validity of, of, a, of a conventional education system. A subject that you feel should be mandatory in schools, something not taught, but you feel that this needs to be taught at a schooling level. Uh, I think it's taught in, in most places, but in different uh, grade levels. But I think the most valuable thing you could learn, generalizable across uh, almost all disciplines, tremendously useful, tremendously high ROI, is statistics. I think statistics, understanding uh, risk, understanding probability, understanding distributions, uh, the way that these modes of understanding feed into the way you then judge things, the way you make decisions. You know, making decisions is everything. Um, the, the better you are at making decisions, the more accurate, the more precise you are, the more you're able to mitigate risk and increase or optimize for, you know, the best probable outcome from your decision is everything. And a lot of that is statistics. Yeah, probabilities. Yeah. What role did your parents have in your life growing up? And uh, and did they push you to, you know, to, to be heavily into uh, academia, to end up in Oxford, to, to be the person you are today? Was it their push or was it something that you feel that you were born with? So nature, nature versus nurture. Nature I think, versus nurture. Yeah, but I think, so my parents obviously played the most impactful role in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very grateful to them for everything. Uh, and they're the two people I cherish the most in this world. They, they counterintuitively, I think most people would be surprised to hear that they did not push me to, to be this type A ultra competitive overachiever. <laughs> that did not come from my parents. Um, although they did not discourage it. <laughs> so they saw it was a natural <laughs> tendency and they just let it ride. But for me, um, they, our, our parents, and, and, you know, this is, I think, a really valuable trait to have now, now thinking of, you know, when I ultimately build a family and have children of my own, how can I embody this trait? Because I think it was so powerful in my parents is that they just let us be. They let us explore. Obviously, within reasons, you draw boundaries and you draw confines and, you know, you teach your kids what's right and wrong. But outside of, you know, moral, ethical boundaries, you 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 let them 
sort of free reign and explore their intellectual curiosities and you have natural tendencies. You can have a kid that 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 leans towards the arts and is naturally artistic and a kid that leans towards, um, you know, mathematics or uh, uh, or biology in my case or whatever it is. And you just let them be and you let them explore that. Um, uh, and so that's our, I think my parents were very good at doing that with all of us um, throughout our different phases and highs and lows and ups and downs in terms of our journeys of self-discovery and accepted us unconditionally. Not only, lo- I mean, they love you unconditionally, your parents love you unconditionally, you know that. I mean, I guess, you know, this is something that as as a human species we take for granted, right? Our parents, our parents love us unconditionally, but they accepted us unconditionally um, and helped us and, and just helped sort of from a very, with a very hands-off approach, guide us, when they felt like we veered off into the right direction, uh, never, never directly influencing, and I think that that level of freedom to explore your, by the way, not just academically, intellectually. Obviously, grades were important, right? You, you always, and, and you're a parent, and you know, you probably want your kid to come back home with a report card of straight A's versus anything else, right? Um, so that was welcomed. But I think that for them, it was more about character building and personality building and developing emotional intelligence. So, for example, when we grew up in in, in Virginia and D.C. as kids for a brief period of time, uh, about five years between 96 and uh, 01. And when we moved back, my parents were at I me. Mean, we, were, we weren't we were speaking English was essentially our first language and and our schooling was in English and. And we lived in the States. So when we moved back, they put us in international schools for two years. But they had a sense that this sort of isolated us from really our society, right? Where um, our cousins and friends and, and our social networks went to school and, and socialized and interacted. Uh, and those were in schools, um, you know, the, the schools in Riyadh where curricula were in Arabic and they were not, many of them did not have international sections or departments at the time. And so um, with the, the, they ran this cost-benefit analysis, I imagine, at the time in their minds of, I'm going to remove them from international schools where they're potentially isolated from their sort of natural social circles and networks uh, and their peers uh, and immerse them into an experience that will maybe be a little bit less intellectually uh, uh, enriching or stimulating uh, or preparatory and make them develop personalities, friends, emotional intelligence that will be far more rewarding in the long term. And I'm so glad they did that because, you know, we we read a lot at home. We taught ourselves. We 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 maintained our grasp over um, things that we were intellectually curious about. We, um, you know, we prepared for our SATs and all our college admission exams. And we eventually caught up with that intellectual world when we moved to uh, uh, different places abroad for university. But what we couldn't catch up, what we wouldn't have been able to catch up with is the um, the emotional, social, uh, personality, character sides of our personality, of, 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 of us, that um, the social experiences that they immer- immersed us and allowed us to, to develop. Stress. Job must be stressful. Yeah. Uh, how do you switch off? How do you de-stress? That's a great question. All my questions are agree. <laughs> That's true. I agree. Because stress, I mean, this was like the number one topic during the pandemic, right? Is mental health and stress management and figuring out what's worth it in life and what's is it, what isn't and abandoning what isn't worth it. And I think stress and, and stress management, the, even the physiological, biological health implications of stress are being more accessible and more... Um, discussed and more talked about across, you know, podcasts and social. The information about this is 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 so accessible now. Stress is so toxic and damaging to us from a health perspective. It's not something that you can do and put off and say, "Oh, once I achieve this, or once I make this much money, or once I do this, I won't be as stressed." And then the 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 damaging the toll that stress takes on you is irreversible. And so managing stress, I think, in in the right ways is is crucial. I'm not saying that I perfected that by any stretch. Um, 
each job or each new experience I face and encounter in life hits me with a new wave of challenges and obstacles that require different stress management mechanisms. So things that I adopted to deal with stress in Oxford may not apply in in this job or vice versa. So you kind of always have to find your sweet spot. I think for me, something that has helped with stress and morale and psyche in general is dissociating my self-worth from what I do. Okay? So a job or a research career or a PhD or whatever will have its highs and lows. And the highs can be high and the lows can be very low. And if you associate your self-esteem with the volatility of any really rewarding pursuit, you're doomed. You're doomed. That's it. So I can't... It, it, it took me a while to do that. And it's one of the things that I think I started to learn in Oxford because the PhD was so volatile. Um, and I picked up and sort of optimized throughout my professional journey. And I'm I think that that's something that I've nailed now. So I could I could have I could face something horrible at work or a disaster or encounter something that I know will require, you know, the next couple of months to fix or whatever. But the minute I the minute I step home the minute i'm home i am able to detach from that in a meaningful way because i'm detaching self-esteem self-worth when i'm immersed in it when i'm at work when i'm crisis managing or problem solving that's different but and and that's helped a lot with stress levels but i think in general um you know spending time with family exercising eating well I have a dog who everyone who knows me <laughs> knows I love him very much and he is my WhatsApp photo and my phone background and this is a very well known fact husky and, husky yeah, yeah. yeah and he's and he's a stress reliever a stress reliever for me there are practical things you can introduce into your life right like all of these things that I just mentioned um uh but but I think it's all it's the way that you're able to sustainably manage and contain stress is psychological so detaching self-worth from or, or your identity from what you do has been a really um, meaningful and helpful uh, tool for me. Has it been better? Have you been better with age at managing stress? Uh, I think so. I think so. Uh, I mean, the, the, the flavors and genres of stress that I've experienced across, across my life are very different. So the, the stress of, an exper- of a two, year, two years worth experiment failing is very different from the stress that we face, you know, day to day in government. And so um, there are different flavors of stress. Mm -hmm. But all in all, I think, again, perspective is so important. So within government, or or if you recently join a job in government, or you're fresh to government, you feel like you're at the, you you, you know, you're at the center of of change, you're building, uh, you're working towards Vision 2030, it's actually more difficult to detach your self worth from that because it's 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 almost it's a it's a higher purpose. You're working towards a higher purpose of national development. You're in public service. You're in civil service. So actually, moving to government and then revising that uh, that mechanism and optimizing it for my government career was a new challenge because how could you separate yourself from bringing in more FDI to the kingdom, right? It's it's part of what you do. And in and, and many ways, I do live and breathe it. And, and my family and friends will argue with you that I do take work home with me and and it's something that sort of never leaves and we're on, we're on call all the time because we are, we are building a future economy for this nation. So it's harder, but it's not impossible. Um, you just need to celebrate the wins when you make them and not let not let the failures or the lows get to you when you hit them because both are inevitable if you do your job right both you'll experience both um and it's and it's a matter of how you how you manage that but this anyone who works in government will tell you the st- the stress is there because the stakes are high wherever the stakes are high you know stress is going to be more difficult to manage what do you say to those who are yet to find their purpose in life develop self-awareness and introspect and reflect because that's the only that you're not going to find your purpose anywhere else than in here um so if if you haven't found your purpose 
or your identity is shaky, or you don't know what to do, or you don't know where you're going, the answer isn't, I need to find the right job, or I need to, um, you know, find the right partner, or do, the, do this, do th they're not externalities. Uh, it's all internal. So the more you know yourself, the easier it will be to um, design a purpose and a purposeful journey. Um, and that that comes from just, it's it's a long investment. It comes from years and years of, introspect of introspecting and challenging yourself. And I mentioned breaking all of your convictions down to first principles and seeing if you're actually convinced, right? These are convictions, building them back up again. What are your belief systems? What are your values? What's your moral code? Like, what? how does your moral compass look like? Um, what what makes you feel the most sense of reward and fulfillment? Uh, for some people that I've sat with and, and done this exercise with, the answer is just making other people happy. Okay, making other people happy, that's easy. There's so much you could do to make other people happy, right? And the NGO space and the philanthropy world, you can make other people happy by being a good a good doctor, a good teacher, a good, there's, I mean, that's endless. So within, and then, and then you sort of work from there, right? But identifying that overarching theme, that mantra of, you know, what rewards you, what fulfills you, uh, what will make your life worth living, that requires uh, being very brutally honest with yourself and understanding who you are, like who is Sara? What does Sara like? What does Sara look forward to? Uh, what does Sada want to achieve? Who does Sada like to spend time with? What kind of music does Sada like to listen to? What kind of food does Sada enjoy? All of these things are, you might think like, what does that have to do with identifying your purpose? No, they, they help you identify who you are. Once you know who you are, you will have a clear idea of what your purpose is in this life. When did you know who you are? Do you remember what age, roughly? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm still, it's, it's, it, it, the process never ends, right? You're constantly discovering and rediscovering yourself. But this is why I described my experience at Oxford as being exceptional and uniquely profound because it was during my PhD that I uh, underwent this exercise in a really, really deep um, way, a, very, a, a way that was very confrontational with myself, right? And what I noticed, for example, is now, because I've confronted my flaws my weaknesses. I know which flaws I've I have addressed and which flaws remain in my personality. I know which weaknesses I've overcome and turned into strength and which weaknesses I haven't yet. So when someone tells me, when someone points out a flaw or a weakness, and I already know it exists and I've confronted it yeah. a million times, it's like, you know, it doesn't get it doesn't get you develop really thick skin, right? It's really hard to get under your skin because you know yourself more than anyone. No one's gonna point out to you something about yourself that is groundbreaking. Obviously, it's gonna be nice to hear people encourage you and and you know compliment you and talk about you know the good things that you bring to the world. You always want to hear that from people, but y y people will 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 not be able to get under under your skin. And it's a way of address. It's it's a way of kind of alleviating insecurities as much as possible. We all have insecurities, um, and there, and all of us have things that we are far more secure about than others. And so, once you confront those and you say, "Here's a list of ten insecurities I have," do I want to address all of them? Am I happy with having like three out of ten exist, and can I live like a, a relatively at ease life that way? Not everything needs to be addressed, but knowing everything is really, really important. And because I, I had the luxury, now I call it the luxury, of spending so much time alone when I was alone in my apartment, right? Uh, um, sort of developing mental clarity and strength and resilience to go do what, what I was doing every day, experiments in the lab and coding and socializing and whatnot. Those moments alone of clarity and sitting with my thoughts, uh, uh, I think led me to a level of deep, deep self-awareness uh, that I continue to recoup returns on that investment to this day exponentially. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the most important thing you can do is introspect. Any favorite books or books that you would recommend to others that you have benefited a lot from? 
Wow, I'll walk you through my entire library. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Can I just so, say that you strike me as a reader? Uh, I, I am, or I should say I was, because one of the things that I... Um, I'm doing less and less with it. You have to, there's compromises and sacrifices with each uh, moment in, in one's journey or with each phase. This phase that I'm currently in, unfortunately, means uh, less less reading, but more of a lot of other fulfilling and rewarding things. Um, I There are many books that I would recommend depending on whoever is asking me, like, what are you searching for? What's your personality type? What do you enjoy reading? Fiction, nonfiction, you know, self-help, inspirational uh psychological so i dabble in all of these categories um and i'll mention two one is siddhartha by herman hess uh it was gifted to me by someone who i idolize um spiritually psychologically is a character is is a postdoc in 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 our lab in in oxford who was just you know when you meet someone and you're like you feel like you're interacting with like someone who has lived as a monk for a thousand lifetimes before. It's just so wise and so centered and so grounded. And and he was a postdoc in our lab at the same time was a very talented artist and drew a lot of graffiti art and, and still to this day sends me his art. He just sent me a, a New Year's card with some of his art yesterday. Um, his name is Fernando and he... Uh, he gifted me this book when I submitted my PhD thesis because he knew I was running off to the English countryside by myself, which I did when I submitted my thesis. And he said, let this book, it's a very, it's a, it's a tiny book. Um, and it's, it, and it's a story. It's like a, it's like a spiritual growth, uh, transformation story, um, that is very deep and profound and filled with lessons, um, it's one of those it's one of those books that's so short but you sit and reflect with each page that it took me what would just from a practical perspective take me an hour to read took me 5 days because it's so reflect like it 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 inspires and provokes a level of reflection that is just you couldn't put it down yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and and so i took that with me to the countryside and i read it and reflected over it and it was the perfect it was the perfect time for me to read that book because I had just gone through the most stressful experience of of writing my writing my PhD. So that was that that's that's a really great book that I would recommend for everyone who is looking for a short, profound, moving piece of writing with a compelling story that is so well done. Another book that I would recommend from a practical perspective is uh, Range by David Epstein. And Range uh encompasses everything that we discussed today on the professional side and the skill side uh the thesis of this book is that uh it, it debates generalists versus specialists right if you are a generalist and you're good at many things versus you have a deep vertical and you're good at one thing and it argues that the future uh our world is is rapidly advancing uh economies are rapidly advancing technologies are rapidly changing and so in a, in a in a more volatile and more quickly evolving world that generalists will tend to thrive a lot more than the post-industrial specialists. And so what this book encourages you to do, and it looks at a number of different case studies and 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 different skill sets that are combined in one person, how that person fared versus, you know, a very deep, deep specialist. And it looks at also this trajectory of how did we go as a society from, you know, these polymathic golden age renaissance type figures that did four or five different things where you could be a poet and a physician and a, a, and a painter and you know you see this in the islamic golden age you see it in the european renaissance era how do we go from that to this post industrial revolution pigeonhole yourself pick one specialty double down on that that's who you are for the rest of your life like you're an accountant and so do accounting forever and you'd be a really good accountant what this book argues is that the trends of today's world uh, will, if you are a generalist, you'll be able to be to fare to fare a lot better than potentially a specialist. With the caveat that we will always need specialists. You always want a, you know people trained as cardiac surgeons and 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 you know really technical uh, uh, deep in, in technical deep verticals. Um, but I read that after knowing that I was always kind of a generalist. And so he describes a model that sits really well with me, which is he says some people are T-shaped. 
And if you if you look at a T, there's a deep vertical, which is your area of of expertise or a specialty that you dedicate uh, a reasonable uh, period of time perfecting and becoming a quote unquote subject matter expert in. And then there's there's this part, the 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 horizontal part of the T, which is your other interests that you could potentially pursue and be good at, but that that you're not necessarily as deeply invested in as your vertical. So I really, being able to um, articulate how I felt I was intellectually into this T-shaped model and all the other sophisticated arguments he makes in his book, uh, uh, I think for me that book will stick with me for for a very long time and is something that I recommend to almost everyone. What are some of your, or what is your worst fear? I would probably say that my worst fear, so the thing I fear the most is being ordinary, living an ordinary life. I think there's nothing that terrifies me more than the ordinary. So everything that I do, I think somehow, whether consciously or subconsciously, is designed to make whatever pursuit uh something feel like something extraordinary or turn me somehow and someone whether I achieve that or not doesn't matter but it's the fact that it's framed in achieving the extraordinary is 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 enough media slash mediocrity yeah I think ordinary ordinary and, medi- and mediocrity could mean the same thing but ordinary could just be dull um you know mediocrity is more of a, f- a function of competence ordinary is just the opposite of 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 life of 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 vibrance of excitement of dynamism of 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 purpose of ambition of all of the, the, these things in these terms that energize me individually i think ordinary is the antithesis of of that but th- but there's again like i said for a lot of people ordinary is just fine and is safe enough and is comfortable enough but it's never been it, it it terrifies me does a lazy person make you cringe <laughs> that was not in the notes I, I, I love the way you phrase that does a lazy i mean probably probably i mean in, you could probably guess knowing 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 me now and over the course of this conversation that the answer to that would be yes but i i mean it depends it depends on your definition of lazy because i think i don't believe and i'm not as i don't subscribe by the sort of hustle go 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 mentality be busy all the time no time in your schedule no time to relax to chill to do nothing for the sake of doing nothing which a lot of people might categorize as being lazy i don't to me they, that's almost as unattractive as laziness um because it's you know Busyness for the sake of busyness is 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 as good as laziness is really, which is not good. And so, for me, I I'm everything. I try to adopt a balanced ap- approach with 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 everything. So, if you are someone who likes to take a lot of time off and likes to go on meaningful vacations, or likes to relax, or appreciates a good film, good television, likes to watch TV, that to me is not lazy. If you're lazy in the sense of like you're careless and you you're not even interested in self improvement or finding a purpose or self development or creating something or making impact or 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 being a person of value to those around you that's what i consider lazy um so 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 maybe the in in the more sort of profound sense of the word lazy yes they they make me cringe <laughs> you know what's worse is someone who's talented and gifted and has god given talent that isn't that is not putting their talent to good use that's what drives me up the wall Yeah, that's annoying too for sure. And uh, what I have read, what I have heard actually, and it made a lot of sense, it resonated with me. Yeah. That the worst day in a person's life is when they meet the person they could have become. Oh, wow. Drop mic. Wow. Huh? Yeah. Sada who was okay with the status quo, whatever, I'll do whatever, I'll go to this school, I'll mm. maybe get this job and versus Sara who went to Oxford worked at the Ministry of Investment became maybe minister of investment one day inshallah oh oh 
So when that person meets this, yeah. that apparently is the worst day of a person's life. When you meet the person you could have become. If the, if if they if they are still able to realize that that's who they who they could have become. <sighs> Thank you for taking it a step further. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's quite sad. It's crazy. Yeah. The perfect day for you. Wow. Um. So the perfect day for me. What does it look like? I'm not going to go through it hour by hour because this will take us another 12 hours. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to tell you is a, is a day that has a healthy combination of the following. Some level of fun, lighthearted social interaction with people I enjoy talking to, spending time with. A lot of time with my family, my parents, my siblings. Um, the husky. Oh, that was a separate, that was going to be a separate category on its own. You just, <laughs> <laughs> so, so spending time with family, gr- spending, spending time with friends and good company, lighthearted, um, and spending time with my dog, uh, running around, wrestling, walking, playing. A good day for me is a day that if someone said to me, Sara, you have until, what are we, Friday? Sara, you have until next Friday to live? How would I spend each day of that week? That's something, by the way, there's, there's powerful schools of thought and philosophies that encourage you to be at peace with the idea of death and reverse engineer a lot of what you do in life from that moment of dying. So I've taken some of those principles with me and try to you know, constantly say to myself, and I've shared this with people who are close to me and friends of mine who, who know this about me, because I deal with, after reading so much about schools of thought that address death in a very non-taboo way, I feel very comfortable with with the concept, right? So for me, it's like if I had a week left to live, how would I spend every day of that week? That's what a perfect day for me looks like. And really, there's not much to it. Of course, I would love to, you know, I love traveling and I love being in nature and I love experiencing things and I love good food and I love... But if I had a week left to live, I want to spend that entire week with my family and dog. Like, that's it. <laughs> It's amazing. It's a good way to live your life. Yeah. And you're living your life in a way as if it was your last week. I try to. I try to. And the moments when I'm, you were talking about stress earlier, the moments I am frustrated the most and at friction with myself the most are the moments that I feel like I failed to do that. Mm. That I gave more of my time to the thing that I wouldn't do if this was my last week on earth. That makes me so mad. <laughs> Such a huge learning right there. Yeah. It's so uh it's so simple, yet very few of us, me on the top of the list, practice it. It's it's difficult. You have to always bring it to your conscious mind and try and, and really confront it and reconfront it because it's it's not a it's not it's not a light concept and it's very abstract. Yeah, do what serves you, do what mm. makes you happy. Yeah. Do what brings you joy. How about failures? What kind of relationship do you have with that word? And do you have any favorite ones? Um, I have a good, I think I have a healthy relationship with failure because of exactly the thing that I described to you, which is uh, detaching your self-worth and your identity from what you do. Um, the failures that hurt me the most are failures that are non-professional or non-academic um non-intellectual right those those failures you can contain and get over and you know they demonst- they they represent learning curves and i think they're they're far more manageable from a self-esteem perspective if you're able to nail that dissociation but i think when you fail to show up for someone you love or you look back you know on a on a situation you know whether with your family or friends you've done something or you've lost someone or you've by something that you could have avoided, by something that you did, you know, for for me, unintentionally hurting someone or insulting someone, or which obviously is uh, the caveat is it's always unintentional, right? Saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to a person without knowing how how that would deeply deeply affect them. So not being able to, and and then facing 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 consequences as a result of that. I think those failures in interpersonal dynamics to me, are more, um, uh, let's say, move me in a way that that uh, professional and, and intellectual failures really don't. In the last few years, what have you been better at saying the word no to? Everything. 
<laughs> I love saying the word no. It's my favorite word. So we always say, even even in my job at the ministry, when we speak to, when we try and do that business matchmaking exercise I talked to you about, we, we try to optimize for a quick no because it makes our jobs easier and it gets us to the yes much quicker if a yes exists. So actually saying no quickly is a really smart thing to pursue from a process optimization perspective. Um, I decline things much more than I accept them in general. Uh, meeting invitations, uh, social invitations, um, because I'm very deliberate and intentional and meticulous with the way that I spend my time. And if I think this thing has no clear objective or purpose that will serve me or serve the other party, because sometimes it's a meeting more for the other side to hear from me something that will be useful to them and it might not necessarily be that useful to me, I'll still take that thing. I'll still do that thing. I'll commit to it. But if there's no clear objective, no clear agenda, no clear use or purpose or value, uh, and it's just, you know, wasting time for the sake of wasting time, more often than not, I'm going to decline, re regardless of where that comes from, right? And so for me, uh, time is too precious. Time is too valuable. Our resources are too valuable to just do things that you don't want to do. Um, so I say no very quickly and very often. They say watch your life improve the more you say no. Oh, yeah. Substantially. Mm -hmm. Substantially. Uh, but you know you won't you won't really appreciate the value of saying no as often again if you don't know what you want right because for people who for That's example true. want visibility a public figure or an influencer or whatever you know you can imagine that 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 y they'll get incoming media requests from traditional media mainstream media podcasts written media and if they say yes to everything it's like you've diluted you've diluted your value in that sense and so what do you really want do you want high signal to noise coverage? And do you want to say something that's meaningful on a platform that matters? Or do you just want to be out there? Um, and you have to know yourself in order to answer that question and then know what to decline as a result, as a very basic example. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I guess if you say no to everything, then the ta it touches on not being adventurous. Yes. Um, so no, try to distinguish what you need to say no to. Exactly. Uh, uh, but I guess, you know, with the experience, that, that, that really is life, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. You, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's something that's improved your life mm. so much that you wish you started doing it earlier? So, again, a number of things on the practical and, and sort of intangible side. Um, I think for me... On the practical side, I've learned a lot of physical um, calming mechanisms, right? So when it comes to exercise or deep breathing um, that help me as someone who is uh, by nature, again, you know, very type A, competitive, uh, can be high strung, uh, high energy. I think if, if I came to terms with mechanisms to calm my mind and calm my body and alleviate my anxiety in ways that I can control, uh, I would have adopted them as sort of as techniques and, and tools in my life toolkit a lot earlier. Um, and I listened to various uh, podcasts led by, uh, you know, famous neuroscientists and, 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 um, and other thought leaders in these spaces on meditation and breathing and movement that have really helped. So that's on the practical side. I think find find something that helps you. We all suffer from anxiety. We all have baseline levels of it that you know fluctuate with whatever we're doing. And anxiety can have a lot of negative ramifications on you physiologically, can increase stress and so on. You know, at the very least impact your your performance and 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 hinder it in many ways, you know, dull your risk appetite, all of these things that really prevent you from doing the thing that is most valuable, which is stepping as far as out of your comfort zone as possible. So that's on the practical side. I used to be a lot more religious with this when my life was a lot more stressful during the PhD. So I used to wake up and immediately do, uh, I had a pull-up bar in my apartment and I would immediately do 10 push-ups and five to 10 pull-ups, depending on how strong I felt that day. I was really strong when I was in, in Oxford. I doubt I yeah, could do Yeah, you keep telling me about how the weight room and all that. Like, yeah, yeah. The... Getting scared here. <laughs> No, so I used to I used to be very serious about it. I'm I I still care about movement and activity and being healthy, but I was 
competitive with my own self in terms of what I could lift and do from a physical perspective. So I used to do that and I used to incorporate things like adding some coconut mo- oil to my morning mm. to my morning coffee and having fresh ginger lemon tea. I was very ritualistic. So there are a lot of rituals that I kept with me um uh from from that time and then some that I've abandoned or revisited or so and then on the on the sort of um the sort of life lesson side I think it's it's this thing of uh, that I mentioned earlier of of know yourself know know yourself and 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 again as 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 basic as what do you like to eat what music do you like to listen to what sport do you like to play what makes you laugh what makes you sad you know uh, know your triggers know who you are as a human being if 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 i would if i could realize how important that is at the age of 13 and from from a very young age uh um you know perform that exercise of 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 self evaluation and reevaluation um but i think i think you know we're we're, we're too young to understand and appreciate appreciate that but i'm i'm still glad i've encountered it at a relatively young enough age um and i'm i'm still enjoying the benefits of that so that's good i think my next one does kind of tie into it or may or may not um you meet your 13 year old self mm. today like teleported and and you are able to say a few words to her that'll help her in her future endeavors mm. what what do you think those words would be So I would frame this to my 13-year-old self, but I'd also frame it to any any young person watching this, really. Two, two pieces of crucial advice, and I've already touched on them, so they're not going to be breaking news. <laughs> Number one, step, or I would say jump, as far outside of your comfort zone as possible. And do that consistently over time until the boundaries of your comfort zone encompass so much that very little ends up intimidating you, okay? Number two is develop a deep sense of self-awareness. Know who you are. Confront yourself brutally and honestly, consistently over time, and do it deliberately and intentionally with the purpose, the higher purpose of self-discovery without any other intention. And that will do wonders for you. You'll know how to pick friends, how to curate fun experiences, where you want to travel, who you want to spend time with, what you want to do, what career you want to pursue. It gives you the sort of the guts and the audacity to do things that people wouldn't otherwise expect you to do, to do because they're coming from a place only you know. Um, and again, the returns on those on that investment or on both of those investments are um, increasing and exponential and continue to increase over the course of your life so long as you continue to redraw those comfort zone boundaries and to reevaluate who you are as a person. Nothing good has ever come from within one's comfort zone. Absolutely not. The most dangerous thing you can do is identify a comfortable spot and stay there um it's it's to the extent that i like to throw myself so far outside of my comfort zone that if i don't feel a physically crippling sense of anxiety in the beginning to me it's not far enough and i know because i identify it i know i start to get you know and whatever that experience is if I'm moving to a new city or if I'm doing something I've never done before or if I'm speaking at a stage larger than I've ever spoken before, whatever it is, if it's not overwhelming me with a crippling sense of anxiety in the beginning, I know it's not worth it. When I feel that anxiety, when I feel my stomach start to turn and I feel my heart start to palpitate and I know this is challenging and scaring me, um that realization alone is enough to actually counterintuitively put me at ease because I know this experience is going to be worth it. If it doesn't take me there, it might be nice. It might be, you know, you get a round of applause or you pat yourself on the back, but it's not going to be one of those like defining transformative experiences that you'll look back on and say that moment meant a lot. 
It's almost like you're a discomfort zone junkie for a second. I will take that label and run with it. <laughs> Thank you. How funny. In a great way, by the way, because that has propelled you to, to being comfortable in almost any situation. Yeah, and the danger is sometimes when you're, especially in the, in, in, in the intellectual sort of academic world, it's a little bit different. But when you're in the real world and you uh, are in a job, right? You start the job, you're a little bit uncomfortable. It's a new job. You prove yourself, right? You surpass expectations. You exceed KPIs. You do a bunch of great things. All of a sudden, that job that you started that was your discomfort zone has become really comfortable. A lot of people, once they get there, you know, they've proved themselves, they know their colleagues, they have a great relationship with their boss, their uh, um, performance metrics through the roof, they'll stay there. Why? Because they're good at it. They know what to do. It becomes operational. It becomes autopilot. I think the bravery is in when you do that, when you achieve the things that you sought out to achieve, when you've contributed enough to say, I'm going to move on to the next thing that... Uh, requires me to step again further outside of my comfort zone and leave room for for this to be someone's new discomfort zone it all makes sense trust me i, <laughs> I, I mean to, i could listen to you talk about about any subject and i would listen with intent oh thank you so much you're so kind i i, I wish i had more than 35 bullet points here but um i don't we 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 have reached uh everything that i wanted to ask you um Thank you so much for 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 taking time and My coming pleasure. on the show. I had high expectations for this episode. I did, as you can imagine, and it surpassed with the rain, wind, and and whatever obstacles were Incredible. in our way. Incredible, um, really, way more than I bargained for. Uh, I look at someone like you, and it makes me proud to be Saudi. You're so sweet. Thank you so much. Heart to heart, my closest would say, Mo, you are the same person on the show as you are in real life. Yeah. I don't BS. If it's not there, I won't say it. But if it's there, I'll say it. Yes. People like you <laughs> make me proud. The way uh, you, 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 you go about your business, the way you are able to explain what it is you do so well and clearly uh, to the point where someone who knows nothing about it kind of understands it. Yeah. That's you know, when you can explain it to like a five-year-old like me, that's when you know <laughs> that you know what you're talking about. That's so nice to hear. You have no idea how much that means to me. Thank you so much. You're very humble. And I meant what I said earlier, you know, maybe one day, inshallah, you, 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 you lead the ministry that you're in or even bigger and better things. Uh, you... I, I really appreciate it. As I said, I'm so, I'm so proud of you, proud of the platform you built I don't think any of us can realize the magnitude and impact and the power of of you're doing this as a pursuit and as a passion that you enjoy. It's your podcast. You built it. It's your baby. It's it's so successful. You're probably having a blast doing it. But trust me, the impact of this goes far beyond our imagination. So thank you for doing what you do. It means a lot to me, honestly. Like I just hearing that, I'm gonna be able to sleep good for a month. Wonderful. And and <laughs> when that month expires, I'll just watch this part again. <laughs> That's great. Is there anything that uh, you'd like to leave us with before we, we let you go? Did we get everything that we wanted? I think we caught more than enough. One more question. Sure. Tim Ferriss uses it and I love it. Do it. Billboard to the world. You have the attention for the world on a billboard for 30 seconds. Not in the notes. What's on that billboard? Someone said to me once, and because I was in a very uh, dark and confused time in my life, they're very, very simple words. Very simple, very cliche. I'm sure you've heard them before. But to me, at that time, for some reason, struck a chord that was beyond powerful. And they are, there is only light. That's what the billboard would say. Wow. There is only light. And so, you know, that, that, those few words can mean whatever you want them to mean. They'll mean whatever... Your your the, the 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 point that you're in in your life when you read that will have a very different meaning from person to person. When I was in that space and and this person told me there is only light in this world, right? Like there is only light. Um, very comforting, very soothing, very peaceful, very Such positive. Positive connotation, yeah, yeah, big time. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Um, mine would be nobody knows anything, but. <laughs> Which is also true. On that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
it just makes you feel that yeah you think that the next person has it all figured out and and i said this on the last none episode. of us know what we're doing we, we don't <laughs> when my uncle said who i yeah. thought knew everything he was like can i tell you something I'm like what yeah. he's like nobody knows anything nobody I'm like wow yeah Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it makes you realize that not everyone has it figured can out. It can get you a long way in life pretending that you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it could, it could. Thanks again, Sarah. Much, of course, much appreciated. My pleasure, my pleasure.